What's going on fellas? In this video I'm going to show you guys a little trick where I learned how to clean plasma cutter shields when you're in a pinch. At like 3 o'clock in the morning I clogged up like four shields in a row trying to cut a thick quarter inch piece of steel for Muhammad. Um, and I want to show you guys a little trick I used which involves just dropping them in a mixture of basically battery acid that I purchased from um, an auto parts dealer. You can see here I got this one to cut okay. It ain't the best in the world. I need to slow the speed down a little bit on these holes. But at least I got it to work. But uh, the first two I attempted, I clogged up some brand new shields. So I'm doing an experiment here to see if acid will burn that stuff out of there. Some of you guys who don't own a plasma table, but watch my videos, I don't know if you can see the massive amount of gunk stuck in this shield here. And why does that happen? Well, when you're piercing holes like this, for whatever reason, sheet cam will, say on the first hole, will allow the pierce height cut to take place. The torch will go down into the metal. It will then move over to the next hole, and instead of raising up, turning on the torch and piercing, it will just start cutting. Like it will go to the next hole and then the torch will kick on and it'll start cutting. And when it does that, it will fill that tip up completely with metal and just ruin the whole show. You can see here I've got a plate that it kept doing it on. I figured out how to fix it. But uh, yeah, I've got all these shields that um, I pretty much ruined in the middle of the night. So, there you have it. And Muhammad, I'm working on you, brother. I've got stacks of plates laying all over the place. I know I said I'd throw you a quick video together, but I'm too busy. I've got too much going on. i got another stack of 28 plates here. These are the center plates. These go more to the center of the cell. The holes change size as the uh, position changes because it's going to be such a wide cell. But basically everything on this counter is yours. This is all going into this piece of equipment. That's kind of one of the main pieces of performance right there. That is going to set this device apart from all the others out there. So there you have it. You completely clean these things out. You can see that discoloration there. That's where the metal slag was. I tried to wire brush these out a little bit to give you a better look at how clean it got them, but that's just discoloration there. There is no buildup. These things are completely cleaned. This one here I did grind on before the, any of this was done and it was clogged up once again. Some of these I've cleaned out with the carbide bit. So that's why they got those old relic scratches on them. You can see all of that slag is gone. It dissolved it all out of there in about two hours. Every vent port completely cleaned out. The cool thing about this is that oftentimes when a pierce height goes wrong, the only part of the tip that's destroyed is this one right here. Not in every case, but it's usually the shield it just gets clogged. That thing is completely cleaned out. Here's this one now that it's dry. And man, it is completely cleaned out. I did not scratch this or nothing. Now, it may have some scratches from me cleaning it previously. But as you can see there, all of those holes are completely open. I was cutting some thick material. And because I'm new at it, um, for whatever reason, the code in this machine will not initiate a plunge height if the holes you're cutting are very close to each other. So if you have two clo holes close to each other when you're plunging into metal, the machine will plunge into the first hole, drag over, and then just fire up the torch like a dumbass and fill itself full of metal. So you have to get into 
the sheet cam code and go to the section where it says uh, minimize warpage and you have to set a minimum of 10 inches in between each cut and then so what it'll do is it'll cut this hole then go all the way over here and cut this hole then go all the way up here and cut this hole and so if any of you guys are familiar with sheet cam and can tell me why that happens you can see here in my sheet cam how far away I have these holes set and the way you do that is you go into, well, that'd be in here actually. In here where it says cut path, you go to minimize thermal warpage or thermal distortion and set your cut distances apart. And that allows you to trick the machine into setting these cuts far enough apart that it forces the G code that is needed to uh, do the plunge. I'm not sure which one of these is the plunge, but one of these codes, for whatever reason, doesn't initiate if you don't do this very odd staggering formation. I also need to point out some things about this. Um, the reason I have it sitting in the sun or outside here is actually twofold. First of all, acid reacts faster the hotter it is. So if you've got this sitting in a cold place, it's not going to react as vigorous as you're seeing here. This is because it's warm. Secondly, if you put acid in an open container and then put it in a shop, every piece of iron in this shop will rust. All of your threads and taps and dies and stuff like that, everything will rust like if you've got stuff like this that you don't want damaged never leave an open bowl of acid in a shop ever i made that mistake about five years ago i was um trying to dissolve some lead off of some brass parts because i noticed that um, the process worked very effectively and unfortunately everything in my shop got rusted i might even have some remnants of that event Ooh, i do i have some remnants of that event now this one here ain't so bad you can see it's got a little bit of strangeness but yeah it uh destroyed a bunch of my tools look at this chrome just kind of eating up <laughs> and this was just sitting out um, i have since gotten rid of a lot of that stuff but um i definitely wanted to keep that in your guys' head. Do not set that thing in your your shop anywhere or you will you will destroy everything. Anything that's iron based um, will basically erode away. I also want to give a shout out to Jake over at Premier Plasma. For any of you guys who are thinking about getting a plasma table or maybe upgrading from what you currently have, just know that the table behind me um, was quoted at about $35,000 from Lincoln Electric the same size and uh, I said screw that plus I had some woman trying to jam an 85 amp arc welder or a plasma cutter down my throat like I told her I cut thin metal only right now I ain't trying to spend an extra two to four grand and she just wasn't trying to hear that so big pain in the neck and one of the things I can say about anyone who's thinking about buying a plasma table is if you're even if you're somewhat computer savvy you are not going to be able to do this without a little bit of technical support in the beginning. So you need to think about that. What company do you want to deal with? If you want to work with a guy who will text you at 9 o'clock at night and give you a response to your answer, I don't suggest bugging him at all hours of the night, but I kind of did. And that brother answered right away every time and got me down the road because there's a lot of technical stuff that you've got to do and configure on the computer sometimes, like serial ports and stuff like that. I mean, I would have to read for a month to do what this guy was able to help me out with in about two minutes. So right on, Jake. Uh, this thing is just blasting out parts like a factory, man. It's uh, the cheapest employee I've ever had. This right here is pretty much what I got. I think I paid like 6300 That's the control box. That's the computer. This is the plasma torch they send out with it. That's a hypertherm, very high quality. It came with the torch height controller. This is a 4x4 table. One thing I am going to do to modify this is I'm going to take some stainless steel and I'm going to put walls up that are just about underneath that beam right there 
so that splash isn't getting all over my rail all the time. Because greasing this thing up is just kind of a bad idea. I found that out the hard way. I kind of knew it would be, but I noticed the rut spots kind of bothered me. And um, if you go to buy one of these things, guys, don't get the bright idea that you're just going to dump a bunch of anti-corrosion fluid in here and you're just going to sail the seven seas because that's not what's going to happen, okay? There's something they don't tell you about that stuff. If you have any type of insects in your area, this thing is going to turn into a disgusting bacteria frat within days. So if I were you, I would just count on relining this thing with stainless steel over time or just drain it all the time. You've got to drain it all the time anyway. Uh, that's what I've been doing and it hasn't been rusting that bad because even with rust inhibitors, the insects that get in this, this is just a couple of hours okay and i'm already starting to get bugs so just forget about going out and spending all that money on that stuff guys unless you've got some kind of filtration system you're going to literally need a skimmer like that of a swimming pool and i'm not kidding you it gets so disgusting that you really kind of grit your teeth and stick in your hands in it man i had like a hundred june bugs in this thing and everything else it was like a witch brew so don't d bother with the anti-corrosion crap. Just drain the tank. Um, I'm eventually going to hook up some pumps and a cyclone filter system that's constantly kind of like skimming the water. I'm going to drain the tank and refill the tank every time I need to use it. And during the draining process, I'll just clean all the crap out of there, I guess. That's, that's the best way that works for me. In the wintertime, I use sodium hydroxide as an anti-corrosion inhibitor. You keep the pH at about 8.3, and the iron will not rust. Um, do not use sodium nitrite. It simply turns into sodium nitrate anyway, which is food for bacteria, basically. And um, also, it's carcinogenic. Let me show you what I use here. You can use potassium nitrate, too. This is just drain cleaner that you can get at Menards, 100% lye, sodium hydroxide. They use that in power plants to inhibit corrosion in their slag system. They have a slag system that, um, well, they probably use it to dissolve the slag a little bit too, but they've got these slag grinders that grind up the slag, and that's kind of where I got hit to that idea. It's a very old concept, back to the 1920s even. But uh, that's my two cents on plasma tables. I am a, a fairly computer savvy individual and I would have never been able to pull this off without Jake because if your serial ports aren't connected to the right bus and all that crap, see, I don't even know if I said that right. You gotta really get down inside the computer. There's even a section where you gotta change the code inside the computer to calibrate your torch height controller. So definitely a lot of troubleshooting that I had to go through. And I would imagine that that's gonna happen no matter where you buy a plasma table from unless it comes with a computer so they say you don't want to spend under 10 grand if you really want something that's usable but i'm going to tell you what jake got me off the ground with this what you're looking at right here and it was a godsend um, this thing paid for itself in about a week with the amount of material that i cut off with it i cut off like a seven thousand dollar stack of material in no time so Definitely digging it. It has put me on a whole other level of stuff I can fabricate. So, that's my two cents, fellas. I'm out of here.